Hey everybody, happy December. I think I posted a video already in December, but I love December. It's close to Christmas, it's snowing outside, it's a beautiful time. But today I wanna to talk to you about shooting documentaries by yourself because you've probably been there having to shoot a project by yourself. It's where a lot of us start out. And kind of why I'm talking about this is we just released No Country is an Island worldwide. Every country in the world can watch it, except you guys in Canada, which is me. <laughs> We're waiting for the broadcaster to put it on their online streaming platform. So go harass Yes TV because they still haven't put it on Castle TV yet, so you can stream it if you're in Canada. But for everyone else in the world, you can watch No Countries and Island right now. The link is below. And what's really cool too is all of the profits that go from you renting this film or you purchasing this film, it all goes directly to helping the victims of the terrorist attack. It's gonna help them with their rehab and getting them supplies during this crazy pandemic. They are still in need and they are still suffering from those terrorist attacks and the injuries that were inflicted on them. So all of the profits beyond what it costs for us to actually host that video on the website, it goes directly directly to helping the victims. So know that you watching this film is actually helping somebody. Why I'm talking about shooting by yourself today is pretty much had to shoot that film by ourselves. Now there was a co-director, Michael Del Monte, who worked on it with me, but we had such little time to shoot a TV half hour project and we weren't sure really what we were walking into. We were coming to a country that just had a terrorist attack and it was kind of a bit, not necessarily chaotic, but we were trying to get information as we were shooting it. Me and Michael actually had to split up for most of the project and shoot it by ourselves. So we were like two independent filmmakers who could do the same thing and did the same thing. So let's go over the tips about how to shoot films, documentaries by yourself, because a lot of us do this. The number one tip is simplify your gear. You should have a camera and one to two lenses max. You should have a 24 mil and a 50 mil or a 24 to 70 mil if you want to zoom. If this is your first time going out, you're probably going to bring way more gear than you need. I, I did this on my first project that I shot by myself overseas. It was in Bangladesh. It was for a really cool organization called Erdo, which is the Emergency Relief Development Organization. And the silly thing about that project is I bought so much gear for it and I brought so much gear that I actually had to hire someone in country to help carry just my gear alone. I had tripods, monopods, sliders, two cameras, everything you could think of. Shot this about eight years ago, so drones really weren't a thing then, neither were gimbals. But man, I just had way too much gear and it slowed me down. If you're gonna go shoot a project, simplify your gear. This was the case for No Countries and Island. Both me and Michael had identical FF7s and we both just had two lenses that we would roll with. I think I used a 24 mil and a 50 for pretty much everything. I think I shot most of the film on the 24 mil. There was just a couple scenes where we used the 50 mil, like this interview of Amajad. But all of these scenes here, like on the train or uh, of the kids on the beach here, we shot all of that on the 24 mil. You find one lens you like, you might as well just shoot most of the things with it and then use another lens when you can't get in close enough. Too much gear is gonna slow you down and it's gonna distract you from what you should be doing, which is telling a good story, is capturing moments and capturing real life events that are occurring in this country, retelling people's journeys or trying to capture their journey as it unfolds. And if you wanna know more about this, just go to my, I think my last video or my second last video, I talk about shooting events, stuff, and not just things. So there's lots of information about shooting docs on this channel if you're interested more. I often don't even bring a tripod, but if you're gonna to have to do some sit down interviews, you can bring a tripod, set it up, sit beside it, and talk to your subject. And then you can throw a lav mic on them, put the headphones on, Bob's your uncle, it's great. The number two point, and this is very important, and I hope you've made it this far to the video to hear this, is know your ending. This is so important. Know the ending of your film before you ever shoot it. And you might think, well, how do I know that? How can I get there? Well, you can make an educated guess of where this film should be going. It's so easy to know the beginning of your film. Getting into the country, introducing us to the characters, seeing the aerials of the place, that's the easy part. But if you don't know where you're going, your film is not gonna get there. You're not gonna get the right footage in country, you're not gonna get the right interviews, and you're gonna pull your hair out in the edit, and in the end, you'll have an underwhelming film. 
So if you can decide before you get to the country, at least a ballpark, an area that you think the film will end on, then do that. If you're shooting a documentary, maybe about an aid organization, get a scene that encapsulates not only the issue that that organization's overcoming, but people actually overcoming that issue if they have. You know, I, I don't know the story you're shooting, but you want to get the ending, some sort of resolution, some way to tie the project together. And this is easy. Once you know the ending, you can start figuring out the scenes that will help you get there. This might seem counterintuitive, but it's way easier to work backwards from the ending, not only in the edit, but in what you're shooting and in how you're shooting it in countries. And if you're filming by yourself, this you're gonna have so much to think about, whether it's your spending, your hotels, all your gear, charging batteries, dumping footage, you have so much going on. But if you least know where your project's going, if you know the ending, you're gonna be able to build the blocks that will help get you there. You wanna go in with a plan. So with No Country is an Island, we kind of knew a basic idea of where we wanted to end this film. The main theme in our film was that looking at the idea of forgiveness in the midst of chaos. And so the story of what happened in this country was there was a small terrorist group, an Islamic extremist group, who attacked these churches and bombed them on Easter. And we knew we wanted to do a montage at the end encapsulating this idea of forgiveness because we heard these pastors and these community members of all different faiths and of the Christian religion as well in these churches who were forgiving their attackers, which is an incredible thing looking in. I, I couldn't believe the resilience of these people and by their ability to forgive so quickly and with such resolute honesty. They were so positive about having to do this. Right away we knew that's kind of where we wanted to end, so we need, knew we needed to get shots of people talking about forgiveness. We knew we needed to get shots of the communities, not only the impact of those bombings like shots of people at the grave sites and of the victims, but we needed to get the people in these communities who were rising above this terrible situation. Jesus said on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Exactly the same thing that we say. We forgive. There is no other option. You have to forgive. Third point, if you're shooting a film by yourself, is it can get difficult when you do the interviews because people just start talking and you end up having a conversation and at the end of it, you feel like you got good footage because you had a connection with the person. But most often this just means that the person told really long stories, they blabbed a bit, you guys smiled at each other, and then you just have this footage that's very aimless and very difficult to edit. If you're gonna be doing interviews for a short documentary or for a promo piece or for a corporate film, look to get some more compact sound bites. Don't just get stories, because stories take five, 10 minutes to tell, and then they're very difficult to edit down. Try to get people to summarize either their emotions or the key points in the stories they're telling. You'll thank yourself so much in the edit when you can just get some sound bites. So for me as a director, when I'm by myself and I'm doing an interview, at the end of it, I think about what they just said and I try to get them to summarize some of what they said because I know there's long things that they've spoken about that I'll never be able to fit in the edit. And then it sucks because then I just won't be able to use that person in the edit because their interview is just too much blabbing, even if it's important stuff. So I try to get some sound bites, try to get people to summarize their thoughts. You will thank yourself so much for this. Just keep honing in on it get people to try it a few times. This might feel disingenuine, but it helps you so much in the edit when you can get tighter, more succinct thoughts out of people rather than them just telling them. Because often when you're doing a documentary, this is the first time someone's ever told this story for this amount of time with someone listening. So for them, they're often processing their thoughts and they're remembering stuff and they go down all these trails, but you as the director, you as the filmmaker can help reel them back in and try to get some more succinct thoughts out of them. My last point, if you're filming a project by yourself, is try and review the footage as often as you can. I, I try to get to my footage every night. Now, Michael, the other co-director on this, he's not a believer of this, but that's his style. He likes to work through it afterwards. But Michael's also shot four feature length documentaries and is an incredible filmmaker. So the film's already kind of in his head. He doesn't need to. But for me, I have a different approach. I like to get in and start seeing all of the footage that I have been shooting. I like to put it in a timeline. I put music under it and I begin 
begin to see what I've actually been capturing, what I'm missing, if one of my lenses is not working. I like to get into that footage so I know what I'm actually filming and I have an idea on this roadmap towards the ending if I've actually captured what I need. With No Country is an Island, we were reviewing the footage so often that we actually had whole scenes edited for the film before we even got back to Canada. We were editing them both in the hotel and on the plane and this was for a film that we shot in less than 10 days. So get in there and we'll start working on that footage. It'll help you realize what you're capturing and it also too will help you mitigate some of those issues where maybe your audio isn't working or like I said, a lens might have been out of focus or had a giant smudge on it or maybe you deleted some footage that you thought you had downloaded. That sucks. I've done that. So make sure to get in and review your footage as often as possible. It's also like for me a bit of a reward at the end of a long day. I get to see the stuff I've shot and you can put some LUTs on it and put some music underneath it and you feel like you're actually making a film. But the most important thing too is knowing if you're getting towards that ending. So there you go guys. Go make sure to watch No Country is an Island if you haven't had the chance. We're taking all of the profits that we make from the rentals and giving that to Hilanka to help support all of the victims from the terrorist attack. So this means that, you know, it costs a little bit of money to host the video on this Vimeo streaming platform. It just said Vimeo on YouTube. I feel like they're gonna bleep that out. But it's being hosted on Vimeo OTT. You can rent that. And then the money that goes beyond the cost of hosting it on that website goes all to the victims. We're doing that for the first year uh, of it being online and then it's probably gonna be for free so more people can see the film after that. But go check out the film if you haven't had the chance and thank you guys for watching. I'll see you on the next one.